Today's scripture reading comes from Romans 12, 1 through 2. And it reads, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What a glorious day to be worshiping with all of you this morning. I hope that you're starting to see the colors of the trees and see the, uh, the beauty of fall all around you. Uh, this morning has been great so far. As I've told Kelly many times, God gave us two amazing children, and our job is to not screw anything up. And so that's my job this morning. Brock has done a really great job so far, and it's, as I see the list of the songs that he has for us, it's been great. He asked me what I was going to preach on this week, and I shared some things with him. And uh, what other church in America can you get two Jonas on one morning? So this has been great. And I hope that what I have for each and every one of you this morning is uh, edifying, encouraging, challenging, but also helps bring us all closer together as a body of believers, but also more importantly, brings us closer to the heart and to the mind of God. Um, if you're visiting this morning, we're, we're, as it's been said, we're so glad that you're here. I am not the permanent preacher. I'm filling in as we are going through our search. So if you're local, uh, please come back. You'll hear someone else and perhaps it'll be better. But we are doing a great job uh, filling in while there is a vacancy. We've been blessed with so many men that have brought so many great lessons to each and every one of us. And I hope that what I have for each and every one of you this morning is, is equally uh, what they have done and what they brought for us. One of the things that I, there's two things that we're going to talk about this morning, and it's been something that's been on my heart for some time. In fact, Chris McMillan texted me about it yesterday, and I thought the timing was perfect because the, the challenge for uh, Christians since the dawn of man and the, the existence of humanity has been the Christian mind in and of itself. And as Chris was sharing some stuff with me yesterday, I realized how close we are to a study that has been on my heart for some time, and that's been the idea or the concept of spiritual warfare. Now, it's something that when you think of warfare, you think of uh, angels and demons, perhaps Dan Brown, or you imagine this, these, these arrows slinging overhead, or you have a, a fanatical kind of imagery, a fantastical imagery of, of Lord of the Rings, or anything that gives you a sense of good and evil. Well, it does it in a sense of showing a magnitude, right? For those that are gifted, it truly is something that is a warfare. But the challenge about spiritual warfare is truly how and what we do with our minds. And so when I came up with the scripture reference that Jonah read, I wanted to have something that kind of set the tone for the wholeness of what we're going to talk about. But there's two very important things that we're going to discuss this morning. One is going to be how we are sober-minded, and then uh, an extension of that, double-mindedness. Now, sober-minded is something that you have to think about and say, okay, sober-minded, sobriety. Is this something that Jonah's going to talk about with drugs or alcohol? Well, not necessarily. But as we see in the gospel, there is much that's said about not being a lover of much wine, or, or things that happen when intoxication occurs, right? We often think about drugs, we think about alcohol, but in fact, there are things that can be intoxicating to our minds that are even more challenging, perhaps, that aren't as illicit. And, and in old times, in the biblical times, you know, at times, power was something that could infect one's mind. We saw and have seen where the hardness of Pharaoh's heart was something that, that God caused, but it was hard before. Right? Because in power and the position that Pharaoh had, his ability to oppress, to cause problems was significant. We saw where Saul, who was put in power by God, became afflicted. Right? His mind and everything about Saul changed. And as he got older, you saw where he became paranoid and all sorts of things that he wanted to do. And he sought out to kill David. And David had the opportunity to, but didn't. And so, there are so many things about our minds that can change. So many things about our mind that can become taken over by thoughts, right? By matters and elements and things of heart. And that's what I wanted to talk to us about this morning. 
that no matter the times, then or now, the connection from our heart and to our mind and the importance of the two as believing Christians is truly inseparable. And regarding our belief, our faith, and the centrality of who we are is spoken without equivocation by Jesus. For when he said the following about our whole being and the love that we are to have for God and the entirety of it within us. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The commandment from Jesus is perfectly clear. And you have to ask yourself, well, maybe you don't, but I do. Why didn't he start, stop with just love God with all your heart? Why didn't he say love God with all your mind? Or why didn't he say just love God with your entire being? There is a distinct connection why Jesus said what he said. Because if you do not love God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your being, things that are bad are certain to follow. In fact, he knew that if we didn't singularly love God in all those ways, other things would find their way out of our hearts and into our minds, where all sin takes root. And those other things have, since the dawn of man, been there looking and lurking for someone to take hold of. And as the writer of Ecclesiastes would tell us, there's truly nothing new under the sun. What afflicted men of then afflicts men of today. Which brings us to 1 Peter Chapter 1, verse 13 and 25, if you'd like to follow. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that would be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially, According to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that when you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. I smiled when the first song that Brock led was Blue Skies and Rainbows. What a beautiful song. What a wonderful song from when we were all kids. Vacation Bible School. But in the words of that song are the words from this, in general terms, this passage that talks about the flower and the beauty and how it withers, but the love of God remains and the word of God remains forever. In this scripture, we also see the contrast of sober-mindedness is linked to why it's so important. A God who loves us all so much and did so much for our souls via his son, and not because of some worldly component of money or currency or any of the like, but rather because God's grace, because of God's grace, we're saved, bought, and paid for. A sober mind, as it says, is ready for action, realizing that it is who we serve, not anyone else, not anything else and nowhere else. A lack of a sober mind, or more specifically, sober-minded thinking can lead to something even more challenging, ultimately, and even more destruction. In James, he writes some very important verses that brought up something until recently I hadn't actually seen or studied, and that is about what he calls a double-minded man. If you'd like, it's verses 2 through 8. Count on all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. And sometimes that's where we stop. But he goes on to say, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. 
For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea and is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What causes the double-minded man's doubt? What is it that his heart desires? We can look through all sorts of components and parts of the Bible, and you can see where men started out strong, but truly became weak. You know, what was it they desired? What was it that Saul wanted? What was it that David wanted? We can look through and see so many stories of humans and see that their hearts desired something far differently than what God had wanted them to do and to be. We see stories of failure. We see stories of falling. And this passage in James was written to those who he was imploring to understand that double-mindedness gave birth to sin and sin, destruction. The idols of his heart is what the double-minded man struggles the most with, more than he does with in, in, in thinking and encapsulating the glory, power, and righteousness of God. These idols are many. They're not unique. It's not just the drunkenness that we talked about in relation to sober-minded thinking. In fact, let's listen to what Martin Luther says about this in the large catechism, because he wrote about this when speaking of the first commandment given to Moses by God. The simple meaning of this commandment is, you shall worship me alone as your God. What do these words mean, and how are they to be understood? What is it to have a God, or what is God? Answer, a God is that to which we look for all good, and where we resort for help in every time of need. To have a God is simply to trust and believe in one with our whole heart. As I've often said, the confidence and faith of the heart alone make both God and an idol. If your faith and confidence are right, then likewise, your God is the true God. On the other hand, if your confidence is false, if it is wrong, then you have not the true God. For the two, faith and God, have inevitable connection. Now I say, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. So too, whoever trusts and boasts that he possesses great skill, prudence, power, favor, friendship, and honor, has also a God, but not this true and only God. This appears again when you notice how presumptuous, secure, and proud people are because of such possessions, and how despondent when they no longer exist or are withdrawn. Therefore, I repeat that the chief explanation of this point is that to have a God is to have something in which the heart entirely trusts. The contrast is really clear about sober-mindedness, and double-mindedness. Martin Luther in the large catechism also talks about Satan as the master of a thousand tricks. As you can imagine, there's no one way that Satan looks to devour. He looks always to consume each and every one of us. In the large catechism, Martin Luther was imploring the readers of that to not read it once and put it down or pick it up a few years later. His imploring was that they should read it every day. They should read it to their children every day. They should think about it every day because it wasn't doing it out of penance. It wasn't doing it out of obedience. It wasn't doing it to show that they could read or do otherwise. It was that as you read it and you studied it and you thought about it and you prayed about it, that it would change you, your mind, and your heart as a believer. It would renew you like we read about in Romans that Jonah read at the very start. James wrote about this very clearly that being double-minded is the true gateway to destruction. In lacking the sober-minded thinking, when the going gets tough, the doubt creeps in, the chances increase significantly that someone will fall victim to becoming double-minded. And what happens to these believers? Well, he says it in verse 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. James is very clear to the early church that he's writing to that what happens as a result of being double-minded is a pathway of destruction. 
He wrote it because early churches were struggling with many, many things, many challenges after the the death and the resurrection of Christ. We've read about it so many times in so many letters. There's so many components of practical advice and commands, direction, overseers, deacons, elders, you name it, it's in these letters. And I think the significance of what James writes about in the first part of the chapter, you can also understand it in the latter part when he talks about life. And what does he say? Life is but a mist. It's just a mist. But he writes about it in a way that he says, but where we're going is not a mist. It's an eternity. It's a wonderful place that we're headed. So when you think about double-mindedness, you think about sober-mindedness. I want us to think about things that we've seen for the last many years. Over the last three years, our church and every church across our brotherhood has had significant problems, significant challenges, a global pandemic. The problems that we face, the challenges that we've had are not unique to Falls Church. They're not unique to Northern Virginia. They're not unique to anywhere else in the world. And it's seen all of us deal with challenges then and some challenges still now. Being sober-minded is the guard of the believer's mind and of their heart to see what's lurking at the hands of the great deceiver, the one who's trying to destroy every single one of us. Why did James and Timothy write these letters? What was it they wanted us to know? You have to ask yourselves at times when you read these, well, your bias might inform you to say, that was then, that's not now. Well, back then, they had this. Or, you know, back then, they had that challenge. I've been in those studies. I've been in those rooms. I've heard the sort of compartmentalizing things and say, well, in the first century, they had this. But, you know, now we don't have that. Oh, no, no. It's as relevant today as it is then. You see, because quite simply, James and Timothy, throughout the entire Bible, cover to cover, Jesus spoke of it, as I read earlier, that the hearts and minds of men would always be faced with the challenges of not only staying sober-minded, but understanding that we all would be at risk of evolving and becoming double-minded, not only in the early days of the church, but of today. Because when the going gets tough, our faith is truly challenged. Each and every one of us have had significant challenges the last three years. Some of us are having continued challenges from the last three years. This church has had challenges the last three years. It's a narrative throughout the entire Bible, and if you look close enough, the challenge is the service of man to God or to evil. It's Cain and Abel. It's the Garden of Eden. It's so many parts of the human story, inside the Bible and out, where man serves the idols of his heart and finds destruction in its wake. David did it and Saul before him. Moses struggled, Solomon failed, Judas succumbed, Paul worked through it, but never overcame it. Every man and woman who's ever lived has had the struggle of what our heart desires and what our mind realizes is sinful that becomes the choice of paths we have as believers. What God hates, Satan loves. And what Satan loves, God hates. Do you love what God loves and do you hate what God hates? If not, why not? Look at what Satan's trying to destroy. God created man and called him what? Good. He knew that he needed a helper, and he created woman. And what did he say about her? That she was good. A man leaves his mother and, mother, mother and father, and a woman leaves her mother and father. The two become one. They'll be fruitful and multiply the world. And he said that that was good. What does Satan actively trying to destroy and has been destroying for a number of years, if not decades, marriages all across this country. Divorce rates, challenges, infidelity. You look for it, you can see it. When he said that man was good and he said that woman was good, what did he say about children? When he gathered them all around, he said, anyone that leads one of these astray that believes in me it is better for him to have a millstone. A millstone that weighs hundreds, if not thousands of pounds. It's better for them to have a millstone around their neck and to be dropped in the sea and drowned. And look at what's happening with our children today. Evil everywhere, all around us. I could go on, but you get the point. There's no middle ground. 
The battle of good and evil has been the battle since the dawn of time, and it's being fought not only around us, in our communities, in the public square, but most importantly, it's being fought in your mind and mine, the mind of a community of faith, and across the entire mind of the Christian Brotherhood. On a smaller scale and perhaps closer to home, we have to also ask ourselves, is what God hates causing us any problems or challenges here within our own brotherhood at Falls Church? After all, these letters were written to churches that were struggling and wanted answers and needed help and guidance and assistance. Our elders and our deacons, our leadership, our ministry leaders the last three years have had burdens put on them that they never imagined, that none of us ever dreamed. And we've been working extremely hard through all those together, individually and collectively. And when times were tough and everything got difficult, I know that they called on the name of God. I know that many of you called on the name of God. I did. And we found refuge, a cleft in the rock, if you will, as the storm passed by. And yet, the struggles still continue. The challenges we have are still many. I bring this story to you, these, these thoughts, this morning. It's a hard lesson to preach. It's a hard story to talk about. Double-mindedness and, and sober-mindedness. But as Oliver sent out notes to us about preaching, the theme this year in love, I thought one of the greatest components of the gospel is these guides where we're talked about and told about our minds and the love that Jesus has for each and every one of us, that God has for us. He gives us these maps, these letters, these stories, these people, these examples. It's all there for us to have. It's all there for us to draw on. It's all there for all of us to reflect on and think about and consider. Do I have idols in my hearts? Do I have desires that are affecting anyone else around me that are a challenge? Truth be told, there's a lot of pain that's been had over the last three years, not only at Falls Church, but at many places. As we've struggled to work through and think about and consider all the things that are going on and what we should do, what we shouldn't do, and how we should do it. And yet, we are here today by the grace of God, worshiping, calling on his name, growing stronger as believers, collectively and individually. And that's the story of the gospel. As we ask ourselves these questions individually and collectively, do we love what God loves and do we hate what God hates? And if we don't, we have to ask ourselves, do you have something that's not only in your heart, but do you have something of measure? Can you, can you peg it to something? You see, the addict or the, the person who's addicted has a hard time overcoming that addiction. They have a hard time seeing outside of themselves. They have a hard time that when they get in their own feedback loop about whatever's going on around them, that they can't see clearly. It happens. There's something very close to me it's happened to very recently. And you have to ask yourself, what is my measure? What, what, what am I measuring it to? Do I have a subjective measure that I'm imparting on someone else, or is it the fruits of the Spirit? Patience, kindness, gentleness. Or could it be the second part of the greatest commandment that, God, that Jesus gave us, to love your neighbor as yourself? Kelly and I were talking the other day. This is the longest we've ever served, lived, or gone to church anywhere in our adult lives. Twelve years. And I will tell you that this congregation is a place that we truly love. And so many of you. Now, there's some of you I don't know, and I can't tell you that I love you yet, but we're going to get there. But we love this church. And it's been hard on us, too. And so, the questions that we have to ask ourselves, perhaps the new three R's, are reading, reflection, and repentance. I'll say that again. Reading God's word, reflecting on what it said, and repenting of things that we know we're doing wrong. His grace and mercy have been there to lift all of us up. You, me, this body of believers, so many of our friends and family at other churches. And when the road seemed far too long and our legs too short, we know we have to keep going, that we need to keep heading forward. And as I talked about a few weeks ago in my communion comments, as Jesus approached his death and saw the death shadow, as David said, and yea, through, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the only way to go is forward, and the only way to go is through. This body of believers has gone forward, and we're working our way through. 
And some days the steps we take aren't very many, and other days there are quite a few. But we have continued to go forward and we have continued to go through. So to try to bring what I brought at the first part into this, it's simply this. Being sober-minded is understanding the ways of the one who wants to destroy you. It's to think about the tactics and the things that are deployed to find, to seek, to destroy. And it's also for you to understand and see the desires of your own heart, to think about those things, to consider what those are, and if they're congruent with what God hates, or is it something that Satan loves? There is no middle ground. If you read the three letters of John, he talks about the light and the dark. There's no shadows. You're either walking in the light or you're walking in the dark. We have to be sober-minded in all these trials that we're in. It's not easy looking for a new minister. It's not easy for so many who have been burnt out and so many who have been challenged by COVID all across this country. We're not the only church that's looking. And where we find the rest and the comfort and the peace is through God. And it's through all these times that we go stronger, rest more fully, and find ourselves engulfed in the love and grace of God our Father. And a faith that is anything less than a faith that stands strong in these times, collectively, individually, and as a body of believers here at Falls Church, is something that will break. It will lead to sin. It will lead to being double-minded and being a people that are tossed about by the seas and thrown around by the winds, as James put so clearly. Satan would love nothing more than to destroy our fellowship. And he does that by destroying each and every one of you. He, just, he does it by destroying me and creating strife and conflict. And that's why James and Timothy and John and all the letters and all the books that we read, that's why those are there. No matter if you attend here or where you attend, if you're visiting these letters are for every church, every body of believers, because one of the greatest gifts that God gave us outside of his grace, of his son dying on a cross, is a fellowship of, of believers, a community of faith that we lean upon every single day. And this church has done that. And as we continue to struggle and work through things and figure out our way forward, and when we realize just how short our legs truly are on the road and how long it really is, the only way to go is forward, and the only way to go is through. So we have to be like-minded as a community of faith. We have to see these things so very clearly. The destruction that is lurking, everything that's happening outside of these walls today, and the things that Satan would love to have happen inside of these walls every time we're together. I hope that this lesson has been direct. I hope it's been challenging. But I hope what you take away from it is that the grace and mercy and love of God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your being, will keep you on a road to heaven. And that's what God wants for every single one of you. Just like Brock has led so many songs this morning, he wants you to be home with him one day in glory. That doesn't mean the road will be easy, and it doesn't mean the road won't be long. If you're struggling with any of these things the last three years or many years, if there's problems that you've had in your mind and your life, we'd love to pray with you. If you want to take on Jesus in baptism, if you're tired of, of the life that you've had that has thrown you around, there's some water right behind me. It'll clean you off and make you clear as snow, white as snow. If there's something that we can do for you aside from that, please let us know. Our elders are thoughtful, prayerful, discerning men who are doing their best to lead this congregation through and forward. So come as we stand and sing.